Okay, so I mentioned earlier that I wanted to move on to the root management in established trees or trees in situ. Uh, so I'm going to yeah, talk about a whole range of aspects for trees that are already established in, in their urban situation or peri-urban situation. One of the things that we really need to be concerned about is both water and nutrients. They're the environmental factors that really contribute most to tree growth and development. Uh, and, and a whole range of species, or each species, has a different, what we call, ecological amplitude. So some have got a, you know, very good drought tolerance, some less so. Others have got you know, good flood to tolerance, salt tolerance, cold tolerance, all that sort of thing. And some, some trees will survive in really impoverished conditions. Other trees will fail in those conditions. Uh, and we can learn a lot by just observing the ecology of trees, their natural history, if you like. And really, trees have got to thrive. I'm not really interested in trees surviving in the urban environment. They've really got to thrive to deliver. And just to illustrate that point, there's an interesting paper that uh, came out a couple of years ago now. And uh, the quote that I just pulled out is increasing annual tree mortality from 0.5 to 4% reduces carbon sequestration by over 70%. That's a huge impact on that one particular ecosystem service that we might want that tree to deliver. And that's over the course, that's modelled over 50 years. We've got to be a little bit cautious about modelling. But um, it just illustrates, I think, the value of having trees that persist within our landscape and don't just you know, last for 10, 20, 30 years. So we're interested in trees really thriving. One of the things I thought would be interesting to talk about is the mechanisms of tree mortality. It's a bit, bit morbid to talk about that, but it's, it's important that we understand why trees ultimately fail and how they fail. There's two primary mechanisms by which they fail. One is uh, carbon starvation, and that's the, ultimate, the size of the carbon pool, how much energy the, the tree's got stored up to some extent depends on its developmental history. So a healthy tree will obviously have more than a, 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 a poor quality tree. But if that carbon pool gets to the point where it's, it's run out of respiration, it, it can no longer respire and so on, ultimately the tree dies. And the other one is hydraulic fa failure, uh, which tends to happen much more rapidly than carbon starvation. Carbon starvation can take years, decades to occur, slow decline. Uh, Hydraulic failure uh, can, can occur within a few weeks, uh, or, or certainly within a few months. And what the PLC stands for, percentage loss in conductivity. So obviously a, a fully conductive system has zero um, loss of conductivity. And once the hydraulic failure um, occurs in, in its fullness, it, it's 100% loss. And they're the two main mechanisms of, of mortality. Of course, there are what I call accelerating agents. They can be abiotic, things like drought or salt stress or compaction, or they can be biotic, uh, interaction with insects and, and uh, fungi and bacteria and so on. They can all accelerate um, those processes, but fundamentally it's one of those two mechanisms or a combination of the two, because there's a certain amount of inter interdependency within those that um, can be quite important. But you know, they're, they're the way trees die, you know, either through total hydraulic failure or through carbon starvation. In the case of um, the percentage loss of conductivity, we actually know quite a lot about which species are able to withstand low water potentials within the soil and, and therefore within their hydraulic system, within their xylem. And we can model or we can collect data on at what point they get to 50% loss of hydraulic conductivity and 88% loss of hydro hydraulic conductivity. Somewhere between those values is when we're going to see a whole cascade of events that actually they, the tree will hydraulically fail and, and mortality is, is uh, coming up pretty rapidly. Okay? And there's been a lot of really good work. In fact, um, Brendan. Choate in uh, Sydney has done a lot of excellent work on uh, analysing different species traits with, it, with relation to their critical thresholds of uh, loss of conductivity. What's actually happening, and I, 
Some of you may not be so familiar with the hydraulics of, of trees. What's actually happening in, in healthy trees, the left-hand panel there and the right-hand diagram, does that make sense? Yeah, um, is a hydraulically stable tree, uh, and we have water running up conduits in, in, in angiosperms, that's vessels, in, in gymnosperms, that's tracheids. And under increasing tensions, so as, as the water becomes less available to the tree, uh, but continues to transpire through the canopy, uh, we get that column of water being under increasing negative tension. Okay, it's a bit like stretching an elastic band out. Okay, at a certain threshold, air will get sucked into the uh, internal part of the vessel, and once that occurs, that vessel is then dysfunctional, unless it's refilled. Um, so it's lost, it can no, no longer contribute to the uh, conduction for, of water from roots to leaves. Okay? And that's the threshold that we're looking at in terms of it being critical for uh, failure from a hydraulic perspective. And there are various um, micro-anatomical features in trees that we could, we could discuss and say, well, these features enable it to be a slightly lower threshold than the other. Um, we can't really dedicate the time to that. But, but what, we, what we mean is when we look at uh, percentage loss of conductivity is air getting into the hydraulic system and when 50% of those vessels have got air in them, we've got 50, roughly 50% 50 loss of conductivity and somewhere between there and 88% is, is a critical threshold that will then precipitate mort mortality. Just to illustrate that point a little bit further, this is the data that's supplementary to uh, the Nature paper that uh, Choate uh, published a couple of years ago now. We see Juniperus um, species has a 50% loss of conductivity at min about minus 7 megapascals, okay? That's really pretty dry conditions if you've, if, um, yeah. Yeah, it's very dry conditions. <laughs> let's, let's leave it at that. It, it's uh, really very challenging for water to be absorbed from soils at that point. Uh, at the other end of the scale, we've got the Bursera species, where it loses 50% of its conductivity at about minus, I don't know, um, 1.2 or something like that. So when the soil moisture drops below that threshold, you know, it, it basically loses conductivity. Uh, and, and then is much more likely to hydraulically fail. And the difference between, say, uh, 50 and 88% of the hydraulic con conductivity can be considered a safety margin. How much change has there got to be before it begets, gets really very serious? And from, from an ecological point of view, that's good for assessing how forests are going to respond to climate change, drought-induced mortality and so on. But actually, I think we need to be engaging with some of this literature, which does get a little bit technical, and saying, OK, well, how can we understand that and apply it to our own context of you know, installing trees in urban scenarios that we know are going to be suffering from drought and so on? One of the things that um, is really important to get our heads around is this idea of water release um, within, the, within the soil. And if we look at the right-hand um, graph there, we've got two blue lines that I'd like you to follow. Um, and th they differ quite substantially. O on the x-axis, we have soil water content. And on the y-axis, we've got the soil water potential. Okay? And the further we go up that y-axis, the more difficult it is for, soil, for roots to extract water from the soil. And the, the classic level of what we call permanent wilting point uh, is 1.5 megapascals, beyond which it's based on agricultural crops, to be honest. Um, but it's the point in which um, it becomes very, very difficult for roots to extract water from the soil. And beyond that, they're likely to suffer from hydraulic failure and, and this cavitation within the system. So in a, uh, in a loam soil, you can see at 20% soil moisture, um, <laughs> sorry? Okay, sorry. 20% um, soil moisture, we've, we've got a really, um, it's quite available. But at 10% soil moisture, it's almost totally unavailable to the tree. Okay? That's really where you've got the take home message. But in a sandy soil, at 10% soil moisture, it's totally available to the tree. 
Okay, so the texture of the soil makes a really big difference in terms of how the tree can extract water from that soil. Okay, and that, that's called the matrix potential, and it's much more, much more valuable than looking at soil water content from a percentage point of view, because a percentage point of view isn't that helpful. It's not what the root experiences. The root experiences the matrix potential of the soil, not the volumetric water content. So it's really important to recognize that difference. And you, know, you can assess these things using tensiometers, um, theta probes, and so on can help you, you, you put together these soil water characteristics and soil release characteristics um, within, you know, within the rooting zone, which is absolutely critical for understanding at what point the water is going to be unavailable to the tree. What can we do in practice? Well, we can irrigate. We can schedule that simply by just turning on the tap or timing it. We can do it automated. Um, I spent a lot of time setting up automatic irrigation systems for my PhD, and we scheduled irrigation based on water moisture sensors. Uh, and they, if water was above a certain threshold, it wouldn't irrigate. If it dropped below a certain threshold, it did irrigate. And, and I was interested in how we can improve the sustainable water use within the tree nursery sector. Uh, we can, yeah, so we, we can irrigate, obviously. We can reduce surface evaporation. Mulching is a great way to do that. Um, we can select species that uh, demonstrate particular drought tolerance. Uh, and that's something that I'm particularly interested in, what we call the ecophysiology of trees. And just to illustrate the variety of ways in which trees are tolerant to drought, um, I put this graphic together. There's two principal ways. They either avoid tree water deficit, so they um, or they tolerate tree water deficit. And this is based on a scheme that um, Levitt put together in, in the 70s. But we can either avoid water deficit by maximizing acquisition, so taking lots of water up as, as much as possible, deep rooting, for example, or reducing the, the amount of water that you actually use through the system. Uh, and I've broken those down, again, into physiological, morphological, and life cycle uh, components. So we think of, of, of uh, things like increased hydraulic conductivity. How easy is it for the water to move from the roots to the stems? There's various things that trees do uh, to improve its hydraulic conductivity. Uh, not least if you compare species, it's just the, the diameter of the vessels uh, is really important. Whether they've got deep rooting or root proliferation, the surface area of root accessing um, very um, wet soil, um, potentially very deep, deep soil as well, can be very important from a morphological point of view. We've got um, stomatal closure to reduce water loss, resistance to water loss through you know, epi epicuticular waxes and so on on the leaves. Leaf phenology, a lot of, lot of trees are drought deciduous, so they just lose, lose the leaves. If they lose the leaves, they're not transpiring. They're saving water. They're avoiding that water deficit that would otherwise be there if they kept their leaves. And then we've got tolerance to water deficit, things like um, osmotic adjustment, elastic adjustment, having a physiologically low turgor loss point, all of those things contribute to the ability of the tree to survive that water deficit or that period of water deficit. And we know quite a lot about how different species behave in, in, in this way and, and, and what, how their characteristics are linked to their ecology. And that's what I mean really by uh, understanding the ecology of the tree and then applying that into an urban context um, through some of the fundamental biology. Just as a way of illustration, I, I pulled out this, this uh, work from Richard Beeson in Florida, and he had a really interesting project using tree lysimeters, uh, which are effectively trees in big containers that are on a load cell, and they can then measure how much water is lost through that system by the weight. You gram, gram of water is a milliliter of water, so if you know that you're not losing soil and other biomass and so on, you can measure um, the, the amount of water that's going through the system. And this is just pulled off um, at the ACE uh, rubrum, I think it is, 15, about 15 centimeters in di diameter. Uh, and you can see the impact that leaf flush has had on its water use. This is actual, uh, the y-axis is actual evapotranspiration in liters. So we can see that the, um, the dormant tree perhaps might use 10 liters a day, something like that. And then as soon as that leaf flush 
um, comes out. We have that expansive area and we go up to somewhere in the region of 100 litres a day within a few weeks. So the, the leaf area of a tree makes a colossal difference on the, the water it's going to use. Of course, there are species differences, the atmospheric conditions, what we call the, the vapour pressure, pressure deficit between the leaf and the, the atmosphere, all going to contribute to how much water it uses, and of course the availability of water. But that just illustrates quite nicely, I think, um, the impact of leaf flush. And actually, um, you need to be pretty on it if you're worried about a tree that's recently been transplanted and has got minimal root system anyway, all of a sudden it's trying to flush its leaves and it just hasn't got access to the, the volumes of soil and the water that it's going to need for normal tree development. So that's a, just a really interesting case study that provides good quality data on the type of, um, or the amount of water used every day. Yeah, just a warning there, it's, it's really very serious in terms, there's a lot of variation by climate, leaf area, species, availability. Uh, it's a quite a complicated thing to work out <laughs> how much water a tree uses, um, but that just does nicely illustrate the point. So moving now on to a little bit about tree nutrition, it's a, it's a really complex field, and I'm going to try and unpack a little bit of it. And I think some other colleagues might try and do the same uh, this afternoon. But we have essential nutrients. I think um, we're probably all familiar with the, the fact that, that uh, plants require various nutrients. To make them essential, they must, the plant must be unable to complete its life cycle in the absence of this mineral nutrient. It must not be able to be replaced by a different mineral nutrient. Uh, and the element must be directly involved with uh, plant metabolism. So that's what we, we mean by an essential nutrient. And we, we, we have macro and micro elements. Uh, they're really just involved, or they're just required in different proportions, but they're all essential. Okay? So we, we have something like um, ten thousandths of the amount of molybdenum that we need from versus nitrogen. Okay? But both are, both are critical. Uh, so, so they can then be split up into positively charged cations and negatively charged anions, and, and that might um, the, the value of that might come out uh, a bit later. I don't know whether anyone's talking about cation exchange, but um, that can be quite an important component of understanding uh, nutrient analysis and, and the fer soil fertility and so on. Uh, and I've just sort of put these, I'm not going to go through what every nutrient does, I put this up because some of you might want to download the PDF and kind of uh, read, read about what nitrogen does or what phosphorus does, but you know, needless to say they're, they're critically involved with metabolism, uh, sometimes the absence of those uh, elements phys physically manifests itself with symptoms of leaf necrosis or leaf chlorosis or something, depending whether they're involved with chl chlorophyll production. Um, and, and, you know, they can be important for a whole variety of reasons, but macronutrients and the micronutrients, again, can be broken down into the cations and anions, um, and, and they can be pretty, pretty important for a role of, uh, of you know, photosynthesis, enzyme production, and so on. And then outside of the essential nutrients, we also get a whole range of beneficial elements that can be particularly important for some species. Um, in terms of uptake, then, we have three principal mechanisms. Well, I should really put a fourth one on here. I'll explain why in a minute. But the root either intercepts the nutrient directly through growth, elongation, intercepts the nutrient that's held in the soil solution. That's really critical. You can have a highly fertile soil, but if it's dry uh, and it's, the water is unavailable, then what, it, nutrients can't be taken up because they're only taken up in solution. You can have mass flow of nutrients moving through the soil um, really pulled by the, the hydraulic gradients that, that are generated through transpiration and, and water uptake of the roots. And then you can get diffusion of nutrients from pockets of highly concentrated nutrients uh, wanting to diffuse that gradient out, um, which is quite a, slow, um, quite a slow process in many soils. Uh, and ultimately then you can, you can have the root excreting certain uh, elements that then exchange with um, 
elements that are held on clay, clay particles and then become available in the soil, soil solution for uptake. And it, 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 can get te it can get a little bit technical, and I think we've got a bit of chemistry coming on later, so maybe the chemist can explain it in a bit better detail than I can. But cation exchange um, is a vital process, and, and so the makeup of, of the soil nu nutrients is, can be chemically pretty, pretty complex. One of the things I was interested, though, is um, trying to demonstrate the value of uh, nutrient cycling. Or before I move on, actually, the fourth thing I really should have on there is uh, nutrient uptake via mycorrhizae. And we'll, we'll come on to that um, in, in a little bit. But this, um, this idea that uh, recycling of nutrients is really key, and you often hear it's like, oh, we, we sweep the leaves away, and we're losing all these nutrients. And I was thinking, well, that's, that's useful, that's helpful, but let's see what evidence is out there. Um, so I started looking at nutrient uptake rates and so on. And in temperate deciduous forests, and I can just about get away with talking about temperate trees over here. You're pretty, pretty warm temperate, but you're temperate, I think. Um, we have nitrogen uh, being about 75 uh, kilograms per hectare. Um, but notice quite a big range. So depending on the forest that is evaluated, phosphorus being 6 kilograms, potassium 51 kilograms, calcium 85 kilograms per hectare. So they're the sorts of um, numbers that are generated um, from the literature in, in terms of how much nutrients required um, for a soil. I've basically created it per 100 square meters because that's roughly the sort of area that might be occupied by a mature root system. Probably a lot bigger than that, but it's just a hand, handy round number. Um, so we've got, a, you know, proportional to that is, is the 100 square meter, if you think of that as a, a mature tree. Recycling is by far the most important source of, of nutrients. You'll see there that uh, some, some comes from the atmosphere, some from weathering. But in forests, in temperate forests, recycling, you know, accounts for, well, 80, 90 percent of those critical nutrients that are, should be then available to the tree. And nutrient cycling itself is a highly complex thing. We've got internal redistribution. We've got foliar leaching through uh, rain coming through the, uh, the canopy, leaching out nutrients. We've got stem flow. We've got wet and dry deposition. Below ground, we've got obviously the organic matter, decomposition and mi mineralization of um, minerals that are unavailable and then become available within the soil solution that may or may not be leached before it gets to the root system. And we have this anion and cation exchange. Some may get immobilized. Uh, we have root turnover that, that contributes to organic matter and uh, weathering and loss through volatilization and so on. It's a pretty complex field to grapple with. Okay, and you know you could explore any one of those in, in quite some detail, um, but what I just, we just want to sort of emphasise some of the, the bigger picture stuff. Um, before I do that, though, I'm going to talk a little bit about mycorrhizae and the way they access nutrients, and they can be absolutely critical for um, nutrient acquisition, carbon transfer between plants, and protection against fungi and parasitic uh, nematodes and, and so on. And mycorrhizae really link together the, the soil, the plant, um, through this, this fungal net network. We get two principal types of mycorrhizae in trees, although there are about seven different types of mycorrhizae across the plant kingdom. We get endomycorrhizae that uh, associate via the cortex, they, they go inside the root, inside the root cortex, and they proliferate within the root cortex. Um, and they generate these things called arbuscules, which I, I kind of liken to heads of broccoli. They're highly branched structures, and that's a, um, a arbuscule that's within a single cell, okay, within a single plant cell. And that creates a massive amount of surface area, if you like, for the exchange of nutrients. Um, from the mycorrhizae to the, to the plant, and the mycorrhizae in turn gets a, a carbon source from the tree. So it's this symbiotic relationship where you have a sort of ni nutrient carbon exchange, uh, and that's uh, the uh, particular part of the mycorrhizae, the abuscule, and the historia on that 
that are these sites within the, within the root cortex. So that's uh, the endomycorrhizae. Ectomycorrhizae are associated in a slightly different way, and they create sheaths around the outer part of the root. And you can see this is a Pisolithus a tinctorius, I think, on the pine root. And you can see the hyphae sort of just follow the, the graphic from top to bottom, um, creating, gradually creating a mantle uh, of very fine um, hy hyphal strands around that root tip. And then they just actually integrate with the top layer or the top few layers of the root and have something called a heartic net that provides an exchange of nutrients and, and um, carbon. So we, we have trees that associate with different types of mycorrhizae depending on the species. Uh, and that can be, you know, we know a lot about that. I mean, ectomycorrhizae typically found in, well, species on the left. And then a lot of species are actually uh, both ecto and endomycorrhizae. Uh, we pick out things like eucalyptus um, within that category. You know, there may be what we call obligate relationships, so they will only associate with a very few obligate uh, species, uh, whereas other mycorrhizae may be more general and can associate with multiple different species. Okay, so again, understanding these relationships and, and, and so on can be quite complex, but in broad terms, I, I think that's sort of helpful to appreciate. Really, we've got to encourage these relationships as much as, as much as possible. The other thing that's very important, particularly in some trees, is nitrogen fixation, their ability to be able to, through uh, symbiotic relationships with either with fungal bacteria, fix nitrogen from the atmosphere, which gives them a massive uh, benefit uh, in terms of their fertility of the soil, um, or their fertility of, of, of the tree, if you like, nutrient content of the tree. Um, in quite poor soils. So typically, you find a, a range of species that are often associated with fairly uh, early successional status and we, we, or, or poor soils. So we pick out Cacherina, I mean, pretty much the only thing that grows on some really sandy sites. Um, Alnus is a temperate species or temperate genre that is well known for having a nitrogen fixing bacteria, uh, but a whole, whole range of others, Rubinia cercis and so on. Um, this nice Circus in Spain somewhere. So that can be critical as well. And I mentioned a little bit about the cycling, but also trees as they senesce and the, as their leaves uh, uh, abscise, take in as much nutrient as possible uh, from the leaves that they're about to lose. And that, that's a really important process. And this occurs I've used the, the red maple as, a, as an example there. You can see the sort of senescing leaves. Um, but even evergreen trees, they're on a, on a constant leaf turnover. So they will always be going through senescence and regeneration of new leaves. And we typically get a resorption efficiency of about 50%. Okay, so they'll take in about 50% of the nutrients that are in the leaves. Um, and then they're probably not really able to extract the rest. They're tied up in cell walls and things that they can't easily mobilize. Uh, and it's those remaining uh, nutrients that are then recycled and mineralized and then available um, to the tree um, after, after the decomposition process has occurred. And we see that uh, both evergreen and deciduous trees and shrubs, based on, on this pretty decent meta-analysis, is about... 50%. Uh, it will vary from species to species, and to some, it, again, it can get really quite complex as to how many how many nutrients tr uh, trees can absorb. Um, but that's a kind of ballpark figure that's is pretty accurate and based on on the literature. In terms of the nutrient contents in leaves, I thought this was helpful because this is what we're sweeping away when we, you know, uh, I don't know, suck up the leaves or compost them or, or don't even allow them to get to the soil because it's a paved and sealed site. We see there's a whole range, the average of 10.9, but the whole range there. I really wanted to just pick out the ulnus incarna. Remember, the ulnus is a genre with nitrogen fixing ability. And if you look at the second column down there on the, in the nitrogen, we see that that's at 30.7, dramatically increased its nitrogen content of the leaves, and that's because it does fix nitrogen um, in its roots. 
So that can be very, very helpful in improving fertility of soils. If you've got a few of these tree species around, they can really help in improve the fertility of soils because, of course, those leaves are then lost to the greater environment, and if they've got shared root zones and so on, the whole, whole region uh, benefits. And again, we can't explore every single nutrient. Um, I'd probably get bored, let alone you guys. So, um, but I just thought it was worth saying that there are, you know, there is data out there saying how many nutrients are available in, in at least some species. And uh, I just thought I'd, I'd flag up that uh, the nitrogen-fixing species can really contribute a great deal to the fertility of soils. So, how many nutrients are removed from the leaf litter? Then this is would be an ideal urban scenario or a parkland scenario, but we all know that that is not the case. We, we often have that leaf litter material being removed. Bartlett's did a, a small experiment on uh, a couple of different species, and they found uh, this is per 100 square meters, so per you know, mature tree, if you like, that about uh, one kilogram of nitrogen is lost through uh, raking up the leaves and so on. Uh, a bit less phosphorus, but uh, you know, again, calcium, um, quite high percent, quite high um, loss of calcium and, and other nutrients through the leaves that they've um, taken away from from the soil. If we look at a, a slightly bigger set of data, um, again, mainly on temperate deciduous forest, we find that it's probably about 3.6 as a mean. You know, there's quite a lot of variation there. About 3.6 kilograms of nitrogen that are lost simply by removing that litter layer. So you think about the consequences of um, this over a long period of time. You're, having a, you're asking a tree to in increase its biomass through growth, but at the same time, you're really taking away a massive proportion of its ability to be able to recycle nutrients. And of course, it needs those nutrients for growth. So what can we do to manage nutrition? What we're doing is we're, we're aiming for a an adequate supply. We don't want too many nutrients because they can become toxic. We obviously don't want a deficient um, nutrients as well because um, then we're going to have problems in terms of growth and development. We can check out the soil conditions, really get to grips with what, um, what the trees are growing in, whether they're paved or sealed, recent root damage, what are they, have they lost roots, does it flood, or um, was water longing a problem, the extent of the leaf litter, or the extent of the mulch. We can analyze things like compaction, pH, and, and nutrients. pH is pretty straightforward. You can get some either good um, color indicators, um, reagents that uh, you just mix up with the soil and change its color, and you can read it off a scale, or you can get a pH probe. And we know that at about a pH of about 6.2, that the nutrients are most available. We start deviating from that chemical things start happening within the soil and things can either be less available, potentially more available, or potentially locked up. Okay, so the pH of the soil is a really easy variable to measure just to see whether nutrients are likely to be available. The bulk density, we've, we've mentioned a little bit before, but we can measure that really quite easily. Uh, in forest and grassland soils, in natural environments, we've probably got a bulk density of around one and that we know that at around 1.4 to 1.7 grams per cubic centimetre, that's when roots become limited in terms of their ability to be able to penetrate the soil. Okay, and just to, to illustrate uh, how that can, can occur, um, just, just one example, that you, you could probably do this yourself. Uh, vehicular compaction occurs most of all in the early number of passes. At, uh, at uh, four passes of a vehicle, we've moved from one, one to you know, almost 1.5 uh, grams per cubic centimetre. And so it's the, the damage that's done earlier on. After, the, after four or five vehicular passes, it doesn't really matter. You, the damage is done. You're not doing any more damage. Okay? It's ev the first, first, second, third, fourth, you're doing ever-increasing amounts of damage. And after that, the soil's compacted. And it doesn't recover unless you intervene or unless there's a lot of biological activity over a protracted period of time. This is a, a, a little video of a root growing through uncompacted soil. It's reaching about 
1.6 grams per cubic centimeter there. And you can see it just, just slows up. It's, it's really struggling to penetrate that soil. It might get through there eventually. Species vary as to how, how they respond, but it really struggles. This second cycle is about 1.34 grams per cubic centimeter. So we're below that sort of critical threshold, if you like. It slows up a little bit, but it's, it's able to get into the new host soil. And then this is even more compacted, it's about uh, 1.8 grams per cubic centimeter, and it's not going anywhere. You know, think about that little video clip when you're assessing compaction. You're looking at how hard the root uh, and the soil volume is. As to you know, well, how are roots growing in this? We know that there's certain thresholds for root development, and they can be really problematic if they're exceeded from a compaction point of view. Compaction actually acts on a whole range of things. If you look at the graphic on the left there, we've talked about the increase in bulk density. But we also get a, a decrease in soil aeration, so we lose oxygen. Um, we get an increase in root resistance. Uh, that's, we might measure that in terms of soil strength. We'll come on to that in a minute. Um, soil porosity um, reduces. Anaerobic conditions increase. Soil biota tend to decrease with compaction. Nutrient deficiencies tend to increase, not least because they haven't got the biota to do the, the uh, cycling and, and so on. And we get a reduction in hydraulic movement, water movement within the soil, and obviously subsequently an increase in plant water deficit. Compaction isn't just an issue with roots. It's an issue for a whole series of biological events that are really key for tree and plant health. So actually what's happening in terms of this resistance to roots is that as the bulk density increases, we get the resistance uh, in, uh, within the soil increasing. And you can see that above about 1.4 grams per cubic centimeter, that um, an increase in bulk density is increasingly sensitive to soil strength. So we, we get a very rapid increase in soil strength and, and consequently a reduction in elo root elongation. So that, again, it's a bit like the matrix potential. It's the matrix potential of, of the uh, soil water that is important. That's what the root's experiencing. It's the resistance, the, s the soil strength, that the root is experiencing from a physical point of view when it's trying to go in there. And there's data to suggest that as we get um, increase our root penetration resistance, we get a reduction in root elongation. You know, the data's out there. There's very um, well-founded science. And this can be the, the impact. These are two copper beech trees one of which was paved over and the other one and compacted and the other one remained in a field situation. You can see what a huge influence that compaction has had. You know, the leaf area index is almost, uh, you know, dropped through the floor. Um, very few leaves left, massive canopy dieback versus really what is quite a nice tree. So that can happen in just a few years. This is another example. You can see uh, the Crataegus levelii on the left there was slightly closer to the development site, much thinner canopy, um, dieback versus the ones that were slightly further away in the, in the background there that I think you can just about make out got a much denser canopy and so on. So we've got a few different options in terms of uh, managing that compaction. Radial mulching is, is one and I'm, running, I'm gonna sort of scoot, scoot through the options till I get to the, my preferred option. <laughs> Um, vertical mulching is another, and it's probably pretty easy to find this, this in the literature if you want to know how to do it. Uh, but root invigoration is, is perhaps one that's um, received a bit of attention recently. And, and really there's a few, a few stages, removing the turf, decompacting around the base, adding mulch and possibly fertilizer, and then integrating and, and, and top dressing. And uh, I've got a little video that we um, shot to try and illustrate that. Uh, and it uses a, an air spade or a soil pick or an air knife. Depending, it's just a different brands. But initially, you can break up the um, compaction with this air spade, high, so high pressure air being blown through uh, a lance, and it breaks up really quite effectively the compaction. 
And then you, you may or may not add fertilizer. This is Bartlett, so they like adding fertilizer. Um, but that not always necessary. Had a layer of mulch on top of that. And you would do this right, away, right the way round the, the root system and possibly fan out as, as well, depending on the size of the tree and how much room you've got to work with. And then you integrate the mulch and the fertilizer again with the air lance. Uh, so you're dramatically altering the bulk density of that critical portion of the root system, that top sort of 20, 30 centimeters. And then we can top dress that with some more mulch. It's a really effective way of dramatically altering the root system and the root environment and increasing the biological activity. This is a, an example where the, a similar process has occurred. A pecan in, in the States looks in decline. They, they did a lot of this root compaction, decompaction work. I think they also did some nutrition and mycorrhizal inoculations. And you know, after year two, it was getting a little better. Year three, year four, actually, We've saved that mature tree. It looks really spectacular and still contributes to the landscape. So you can turn trees around if the, the problems lie in the, in the root system. So I would emphasize things like biomimicry and uh, trying to emulate the woodland within the urban or the, the parkland situation where possible. And mulch is uh, really key to that. Again, we've got a whole range of variables that mulch acts on. It reduces competition, increases nutrition, it, it s slows down any temperature fluctuations, improves soil moisture retention, reduces disease, improves biota, reduces compaction, enhances root establishment, as illustrated on the, on the right-hand graphic there, reduces the impact of contaminants, and uh, ultimately improves performance. So mulch is a really valuable thing to do. It's an easy gain from a plant health care perspective. And of course, there are commercial products from fertilizers to mycorrhizal injections and so on. And maybe the value of those will come out in discussions later. We can uh, inject the soil with uh, a fertilizer, liquid-based soluble fertilizer, through something uh, like this. It's not as effective as the root invigoration process I showed you before, but it is probably uh, a lot cheaper to do, and you could get through a higher population of trees. Um, but ultimately, I'd still be, cons if that was compacted, you know, above 1.5 grams per cubic centimeter, I'd be concerned about addressing that first. And there's stem injections uh, as options as well. And, and you know, again, we can, if we have time later, we can discuss the merits of those. Two minutes, is that okay? Thanks, sorry. I'm, I'm jibber-jabbering. So most of you will, or some of you at least, will have uh, seen similar processes before. There's different ways you can do it, but this is a quite a straightforward way. Insert the product. This can be either pesticide or, we're talking about nutrition, it can be a nutrient solution. And uh, once you, you tap into the xylem of an actively transpiring tree, add the product to the capsule there, uh, and just pressurize that capsule a little bit, then the, the uh, this hydraulic stream, if you like, going up the tree will take that nutrient up and uh, distribute it within the canopy. And various other options. This is something that's come out of Germany recently, similar to the Terra vent, if you're familiar with that, but um, compressed air is sort of injected into the soil to, to break up the, root, the, the soil and, and the root system a little bit more aerate it. And, and that can be quite effective in some circumstances. There are problems with overdoing it. Definitely don't overdo the nitrogen. It can increase the growth rate of shoots beyond which they would normally be able to do. You can have ina inadequate supporting tissue lead to poorly developed root systems because they're having an artificial um, fertilization, if you like, and not really going out and seeking um, good soil volumes themselves. It can increase susceptibility to various pests and diseases. Uh, the other thing I would really advocate is utilizing species trait, like the nitrogen fixing. Um, like uh, evergreen species are typically more nutrient efficient. That's why they often survive better on uh, impoverished areas. 
um, and learn from you know agroforestry in terms of some of the the structures they they develop. This is I think the final slide, and this just illustrates again the value of soil biology. Uh, there was two different stands, one of Tilia, one of Fagus, and after 50 years they evaluated the nutrient content. They found that underneath the Tilia tended to be much, much more fertile, and when they really unraveled all of this, they found that the Tilia supported a particular species of earthworm that the beech didn't. You know, so you can have some highly um, engaging but also highly complex operations that can, or, or variables that, that impact on nutrition. That's my summary. I think I've gone over it all. Think about the mimicry side of things. Think about the case for intervention. Make sure you've got evidence to intervene if, if that's what you're going to do. And yeah, thanks for your time.